right, this is The Daily Strike with your host, David Shaminsky. We have two very, very special guests with us today. Been working a little over a month to get these guys in here. They have a very busy schedule, but man, these guys are awesome. We have Dr. Kareem Kandil and Adrian Menmedi with Better Living Botanicals. How are we doing today? Excellent. Thank you for having us here. Doing nope. well, man. No problem. I think you guys are taking the time out of your busy schedule to you know sit down and have this conversation because really what we're talking about today is very relevant and I feel it's very important to you know societies today and the way car- culture is moving. So you know I'm definitely excited to kind of jump into this. But for the viewers that are listening, I definitely want you guys to kind of go in depth, you know, a little bit, you know, about who you are, you know, and what kind of got you here. So they understand, you know, your credit, your credentials and, you know, who you are. So uh, Dr. Kareem, we'll start with you first. I mean, definitely just, you know, what got you here and who is Dr. Kareem? All right. Well, um, thank you again, David. Um, so I'd say my interest in medical cannabis began over a decade ago while I was working as an emergency medical scribe in Houston. And just kind of seeing the differences between people who are, say, coming in intoxicated on alcohol versus people who've been using cannabis versus people who've been using other kinds of hallucinogenic substances and trying to understand, you know, why people were using cannabis and what potential benefits they saw from that. So I'd already been doing a little bit of my own digging before um, attending medical school at Ross University um, School of Medicine in Dominica. And um, while I was there, I got a little bit more of an introduction to kind of the local use of plant medicines, and that kind of further um, spurred me on my journey to kind of learn more about how, you know, plants and plant medicine could be used for um, wellness and health, and specifically um, cannabis. And so during that period, I did a research presentation that I uh, presented to the faculty there um, at Princess Margaret Hospital in um, Russo, Dominica, on the therapeutic potential of cannabinoids. Um, It was, uh, you know first kind of deep dive um, for me, um, really kind of learned a lot and have evolved in my understanding since. Um, And after graduating from medical school, um, I had a chance to actually work for a year um, here in Naperville, no less, uh, for the um, insurance industry doing uh, telemedicine and kind of got me a little bit more to understand how the economics of the system works and unfortunately where physicians kind of have their hands tied in that. Um, I also had an opportunity to shadow a holistic um, uh, physician here in um, Naperville, Dr. Madiha Saeed, and, you know, really kind of further confirmed what my research had been showing in terms of uh, natural health and healing therapeutics. Um, It was during that period that I found out that there was a naturopathic medical school um, here in uh, Chicagoland, Illinois, in Lombard, uh, National University of Health Sciences, um, the uh, only accredited uh, four-year naturopathic medical um, institution in the Midwest. And... Um, what was there that I met my good friend uh, Adrian, our first day in uh, orientation, and Adrian, Yo. we definitely uh, bonded over a uh, you know shared love of the you know um, therapeutic potential of cannabis, and you know just kind of continued to do more research and presentations on the topic. Um, um, as for CBD specifically, I kind of became aware of some of the CBD formulations derived from industrial hemp um, around 2014 around the time of the farm bill. Um, And at the time, um, most of the CBD that we were finding was coming from Europe, from European um, fiber hemp um, cultivars and using um, different extraction technologies they're able to extract the CBD out. Um, And while we were in school and we um, were doing a little bit more research and finding out more about some of the domestic hemp and domestic CBD, um, Wisconsin at the end of 2017 had passed their own version of the farm bill um, allowing the uh, cultivation of industrial hemp. Um, it seemed to be a very reasonable um, law and system that they put in place and so we uh, all knew at that point we were going to start growing hemp and get into the CBD industry. That's incredible man. If they don't believe you now after what you just said <laughs> they need to like re-listen to what you just said because you're very credible man. Now, Adrian, your turn, man. So Yeah, so great intro there, Kareem. Thanks. Um, and it's a really interesting story. My story is uh, I came to cannabis kind of later on in my life. I didn't touch it until I was 26. And, you know, I come from a very different background. I was in business. I was in sales. My undergraduate at DePaul was in finance and accounting. And then, you know, I had nothing to do with medicine or, or any of that. And then I moved out to California got involved in the cannabis industry with an edible subscription box and met some naturopathic doctors at cannabis conferences. And I was like, whoa, what's this naturopathic medicine thing? And found out there's a school right by where I'm from in Illinois. So I moved back and that's where I met Kareem, first aid orientation. (laughs) So everything happens for a reason, I believe, you know, and uh, 
ever since then, we just really became interested in what's going on in this industry. You know, our, our whole goal in getting into medicine is trying to help people. And, and I really believe it's the beginning of a paradigm shift in medicine with moving more towards holistic, plant-based, natural solutions that are actually helping people, you know, getting to the root causes of what they have going on versus just covering up the symptoms with another pharmaceutical. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited about what's going on in this industry with what we've got going on with Better Living Botanicals and, and just lots of great stuff. It, I mean, it's the whole idea behind it. I mean, I, I love it. I think it's beautiful because I, I'm – are you guys uh, familiar with the artist Nipsey Hussle that recently mm-hmm. just passed away? Yeah. No, yeah. I'm not going to go into that. But I know that he was working on a documentary on a certain individual – um, I can't remember the name, but he Dr. was... Dr. Sebi. Yeah, he something. was in the same kind of uh, arena you guys are in. Yeah. And uh, it's just crazy to see, like, he used those natural uh, herbs and remedies and stuff like that to possibly cure, you know, AIDS, uh, HIV, cancer, and stuff like that, too. But, like, a lot of those doctors kind of just disappear. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, not to go to, con- to conspiracy, but, like, that's just what happens. Like, people that cure those major... Uh, diseases that people are suffering from, they disappear because, you know, those pharmaceutical companies are like, well, no, because now you're taking away from our profit. So that's just, I don't know, that's kind of like what I see. I, I mean, it guys... makes sense, man. It's, you yeah. know, the cancer drug industry alone is $200 billion. Seriously. So you, you threaten that and yeah, you're going to yeah. be on someone's list, you know? Seriously, like that's huge. I can't remember who I was having a conversation with it about it, but I was, I brought up the fact that uh, I mentioned that I'm like, why would they have a cure for cancer when it costs so much more to suffer? And mm-hmm. have to continually keep going back to the hospital, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the person's like, well, no, because they could just charge X amount for the cure. But I'm like, that's a one-time fee. What about the multiple, you know, times you have to go there for years to get, you know, cured, essentially? You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a really uh, dirty industry at times. I think that um, there's enough evidence from statements from the FDA, for example, um, or statements that were within the um, uh, Health and Human Services Research Patent on Cannabinoids, uh, patent number 6630507. Um, This uh, looks at research of cannabinoids as neuroprotectants. So this was filed in 1998, published in 2003. So over 20 years now that we have had this, um, nearly 20 years we've had this evidence of the potential use of cannabinoids in all kinds of inflammatory conditions, neurodegenerative conditions, um, even with concern of things such as uh, stroke and um, heart disease. And part of the aspect of the research patent was to try to see, okay, by substituting different groups, can we create these new novel cannabinoids that can go ahead and be patented as pharmaceuticals? And there have been a few attempts that have, you know, for the most part, Some of them seemed to work, you know, okay. Um, Some of them had some pretty severe side effects like Ramonabant. It was meant to be a weight loss drug by blocking the CB1 receptor. And they had to recall that after a lot of suicidality and severe depression that came out from from that. So um, I think that as well as, um, you know, recent former Commissioner Scott Gottlieb's comments on, you know, regarding, you know, CBD and the hemp industry and there needing to be kind of a space for the pharmaceutical industry to play in it. So there, there's no denying the amount of money that's there, the potential amount of money, um, some of the, you know, estimates, you know, and the billions that can be lost if, you know, CBD or other cannabinoids were used as replacements. Um, the evidence of more and more patients substituting one or more of their drugs or eliminating their drug regimens altogether because of, you know, how CBD might be helping um, their bodies, their systems kind of get back into that um, homeostasis, into that equilibrium. So, there are definitely some issues. I think when it comes to cancer, I always, you know, advocate a bit of caution that it is a bit complex and, you know, rarely is it going to be that there's a singular thing that can be a cure. But in my research about cannabis, besides just its potential uses for treating the side effects of cancer treatment, I found a lot of evidence that was showing anecdotal and otherwise of the use of uh, cannabis and cannabinoids in treating tumors. And if you study, you know, manuscripts from, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, you know, um, Islamic Yunani medicine, you, um, Ayurvedic medicine, you'll find that the use of cannabis for shrinking and drying up tumors has been an established, you know, use for literally thousands of years. So it's just kind of a rediscovering of what had already been known mm-hmm. um, and just kind of application at a higher level now. Right. Definitely, man. Definitely. And 
I, don't, I didn't mean to call it like a dirty industry. There's just like dirty parts of it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I, not, I, there's, a lot, of course, a lot of good people like yourself that are looking for the biggest benefit, you know, to help other people. So I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to add really quick, uh, so much so for cancer that in Israel, they have actually uh, volcano vaporizers in the hospital next to the patient's beds. Volcano, you talking about the... The, the vaporizer with the yeah, bags. the bag and they take it off. Yeah, and, they okay. have that in the hospital in Israel for cancer patients. They smoke in the hospital. That's incredible. So clearly there's some science and some, you know, results to back up that this is working. If They even show that in the weed documentary that was on CNN with Dr. Sanjay Gupta. They showed that and it was just, that was like three or four years ago. Yeah. So it's just like, it's really blowing up. There's so much research going on worldwide and with it being Schedule 1 here in the U.S., it's limited quite a bit of research from happening. But that's all changing. And, you know, I think leading with the CBD industry as well because, you know, it is more approachable to people. There is very little or no THC, and a lot of people are scared of the high. You know, I always tell people, it's like we're not about getting people high. It's about helping people, about healing people. And then, by the way, if you happen to get high, it's not the worst side effect ever. That's just the stereotype that, <laughs> right. you know, that's put out there. Like, oh, if you're smoking anything to do with weed, you're getting high. But, like, that's not really the case. You're just, right. you're just looking at the stereotype. you got to look deeper outside the box. <clears throat> There's actually benefits behind not only getting high, but, like, the CBD part of it. I mean, that's huge. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know a patient here in Illinois that has a medical card. She has Lyme disease. She has CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. And she said, she's famous in quoting that she's never smoked cannabis and she's never gotten high but she uses it every day for her medicine to sleep for her pain for everything so it's like you know people need to change she's over 50 people need to yeah. change their whole mindset on what is a medicine yeah you know well, in many respects we're not actually like bringing a new medicine um if we look back historically cannabis was a part of the u.s pharmacopoeia right. up until the 1940s after which point it got removed so actually can i add something to that too sure. historically i think it goes back to eight i think what i researched 8000 bc the use of well, it, it, well hemp. hemp hemp was used i'm sorry but well yeah it, from what we know from um recorded chinese history yeah. um as well as i mean some of the other um, nomadic tribes you know in central asia cannabis um sativa in its name sativa means that it's a cultivated crop um is one of humanity's oldest cultivated crops, um, traditionally used um, for fiber, um, as well as the food that came from the seeds, and then of course using the flowers for medicine. And despite the fact that there's been an awareness, you know, that there's you know the um, quote unquote intoxicating versus non-intoxicating varieties of cannabis, uh, THC and CBD, those molecules have always been present in the plant, just kind of in differing ratios depending on how that plant has been uh, cultivated in its genetics. Right. I know there's even been, uh, you know, from what's been written from history, that like I think it was George Washington and uh, I can't remember the other president that uh, said it, um, but they're both quoted saying like, you know, hemp is the way of the future. And that, they're saying that way back when, and here we are now. And we're making that push. Well, you have to understand, hemp has historically played an important role in global commerce because of its fibers are some of the strongest naturally occurring fibers. So when you're sailing across the oceans, you're not going to play around with cotton or jute or anything like that. You only used hemp sails and hemp ropes. That's what got you across the ocean. So yeah. when um, settlers first came to this country, they actually had were required to grow hemp um, in Virginia um, and it's interesting to see Virginia, again, is kind of, you know, coming up and coming again in the hemp industry um, today. So it, this was something that has been cultivated in the U.S. Uh, during World War II, uh, during the government campaign Hemp for a Victory. Um, hemp was uh, subsidized and highly encouraged for farmers all over the country to require to be able to meet those quotas for paracord shoots, for equipment, for canvases. In fact, the term canvas, you know, comes from the Dutch word for cannabis. Um, because oh. that's historically, you know, the types of fibers that were um, used for that purpose because of their strength, because of their reliability. Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. And the president was uh, Thomas Jefferson and mm -hmm. George Washington. And Thomas Jefferson said, hemp is the first necessity to the wealth and protection of the country. And then George Washington went on to say, make the most you can of the Indian hemp seed and sow it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a very uh, good point I'd like to also differentiate. So... You mentioned Indian hemp seed, and uh, when we talk about the terms cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, traditionally speaking amongst the understanding, whether in traditional homeopathy or um, amongst botanists, oftentimes cannabis indica was thought to be the high THC drug strains, if you would, 
um, as, again, they came from areas of India and Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush Valley, um, whereas sativa typically referred to the kind of, you know, fiber seed strains of um, hemp that were um, grown throughout Europe and Asia. However, some of those definitions have kind of been played around with and muddied and are not fully clear if we were, really want to be clear, but yeah. Indian hemp is just kind of one, what was the historical uh, classification for what we now today think of as being marijuana. Interesting. I did not know that whatsoever. And honestly, the thought I just had in my head, do you ever see those Facebook videos? Like even on like documentaries, you see those videos of kids that like suffer from seizures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they show that they put the CBD on their feet or, you know, they put it, give them the drops and it helps. But yet you still have people that are like, oh, that's bad. I can't believe you're doing that. Or like states consider it legal, you know, illegal. So they have to move their whole entire family mm -hmm. to a state where it's illegal because, you know, unfortunately, you know, the reaction their kid's having. But um, I just that just crossed through my head and just kind of like it upsets me a little bit because like you clearly can see the benefits behind it. Why are we still, you know, saying, you know, or, you know, we were saying this is bad. Like it took so long to get to this point, you know. Well, I think if you want to really kind of look at the, the history of the drug war, you have to understand that, you um, it was an opportunity to kind of deal with some emerging political issues um, by using a certain kind of guise of an enemy, this this menace, the devil's lettuce, the reefer madness the kind devil's of lettuce. <laughs> that had sort of been, um, you know, encouraged. And it was oftentimes predicated on very um, racist propaganda that basically, you know, white women would seek to have relations with Negro men and, mm -hmm. you know, they would all get caught up in jazz music and whatnot. And it was a way to not be able to directly, you know, criminalize you know, blacks and Latinos, but criminalized the people that historically those immigrant populations that had used, you know, cannabis as kind of this, you know, um, you know, relieving medical herb for themselves, um, whether it's to inspire creativity, whether it's just to deal with, you know, the, you know, the rigors of manual labor, you know, there's, there's many potential uses of it. And, um, and I think when people want to talk about, you know, and evaluate is something good, is something bad, let's, let's talk about just basic kind of safety toxicology. Um, when it comes to cannabis itself, we don't have any evidence of any actual, you know, recorded overdose deaths from cannabis itself. We don't have uh, increased uh, risk in lung cancer or emphysema in the same way that we have for smokers. This is based on 20-year uh, longitudinal studies done out of UCLA, um, Berkeley, by uh, Dr. Donald Tashkin, one of the professor emeritus pulmonologists there. So, um, so in that regard, I think we can already see that you know, whether it's done in, you know, different studies by the Lancet and whatnot that looks at, you know, cannabis's relative, you know, harm versus, you know, addictiveness and whatnot. And it's still, you know, is relatively speaking, you know, lower than that of coffee. But I think uh, if you want to talk about where the real harm comes from, unfortunately, comes from the policies around it. And, uh, yep. and even for those who are venturing into the sphere of, you know, hemp for whatever purposes, you know, whether it's going to be for cannabinoid extraction, whether it's going to be for seed or whether it's going to be for fiber, they still have to kind of tiptoe and navigate around these kind of laws and arbitrary limits as to what amount of a plant's naturally occurring substances can be in that plant. So. That's ridiculous. Once the government gets their hands on it, they're like, well, we got to do this, this, that, and third, and this, this, and that, and third, and enough. <laughs> Basically, if we use the standard of the supposed overcautiousness over the last several decades that we use towards, you know, cannabis, I don't think anything would ever get done. So I think it's... Uh, it's unfortunate there is a little bit of a double standard that completely new synthetic chemicals are being produced every single day, making their way into the environment. Oftentimes, we don't really know the long-term impact till a few decades down the road. I mean, we've been told the same story over and over again. It's absolutely safe. PCBs, great fire retardant. Now we have all these issues, people with uh, you know kidney problems, and it persists in the environment for you know extended period of time. So. I think that there definitely needs to be a, a balanced approach in kind of how we evaluate it, looking at the safety alone. Are there risks that can possibly be associated with high THC cannabis? Absolutely. And I mean, the main ones we tend to think of are people who have a, you know, first degree family relative with a history of bipolar or schizophrenia. High THC can aggravate and uh, precipitate psychosis. But we've often seen that the concerns that may occur over naturally occurring THC still pale in comparison to what may happen with some of these unregulated um, synthetic, um, you know, man-made chemicals that act like cannabinoids that oftentimes can result in um, severe psychiatric issues um, and, you know, potential cardiovascular risk as well. So basically, people with those, you know, higher mental disorders shouldn't smoke like high-potent THC uh, strains. This should be lower THC, more CBD. Is that kind of the direction? Well, 
Well, given what we know about CBD and some of the clinical studies, um, you know, done on the antipsychotic effects of CBD compared to a misoprid, a um, antipsychotic um, for use in, you know, schizophrenics, um, and it was found that it had a, you know, similar efficacy while having a much more tolerable side effect profile. So. In the um, research uh, patent that I mentioned earlier, they had been looking at some of the studies in which very high doses of CBD, like several hundred grams were given per day. Wow. And it was pretty much tolerated, but typically at those doses, the things people most commonly um, experience would have been either you know, a little bit of diarrhea, some uh, sedation, uh, somnolence, and possibly a little bit of uh, dry mouth or dizziness. And that's typically at amounts that are much higher than the therapeutic amounts needed. And again, it's also important to note that, again, because of the uh, pharmaceutical dogma in terms of how we approach medicine and pharmacology, they're oftentimes studying exclusively these CBD isolates. So the um, currently existing um, FDA-approved CB drug that is out there, Epidiolex, is pretty much a CBD isolate um, that is going to be devoid of the other cannabinoids, THC, and some of these smaller, lesser cannabinoids. CBG, CBC, CBN, um, and because of that, um, from the studies that we've looked at comparing um, full spectrum, something that has the, the, all the different cannabinoids in it versus something that is just an isolate, that whereas the dose, as you increase it, you seem to get an increase in efficacy with a full spectrum, with an isolate, you get that up to a certain point, but once you pass a certain threshold, you start actually losing efficacy. So it, it's pretty interesting, and of course, you know, results very individuals vary. Um, but I think it, it's important to know that even at levels that are not typical, even at levels that are probably excessive, we still have a substance that is still overall remarkably safe. And I think that that first and foremost needs to be a selection criteria, whether or not it is the best indicated for a particular situation or whatnot. That's something that, you know, um, additional studies would help us um, clarify further. Interesting, for sure. Okay, so let's jump into the the many uses of hemp. So, I mean, there's so many uses. I mean, between smoking it to fibers to making rope to, I mean, you name it. So, like, I kind of have, like, an idea, but let's kind of go through the list. I mean, so let's start with the stalk of the, the hemp. I mean, what from what I've researched, I mean, you got fiber, textiles, insulation, organic compost, uh, animal bedding, fiberboard, rope. Um, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, just from that, that plant alone, you're able to you know, organically create these items and, you know, so I, this kind of jump into that. I just find that really interesting. So, I mean, you guys want to kind of chime yeah, in I mean, on that. A big one in there is hempcrete, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that can revolutionize the entire construction industry. I mean, it's stronger than existing concrete, it fireproof, you know, all of these different things. I was going to ask that. Is it, is it fireproof? It, it is fireproof. Yeah. You can actually uh, look up on YouTube some people in which they do these tests on hempcrete and it, it's pretty interesting. They just like have like a blowtorch to it. And so, <laughs> Um, it, what's interesting about hempcrete is that it's actually a carbon negative type of building material. So um, you have twofold benefit. On the one hand, you're taking all of this carbon that has been fixed by the hemp plant into its stalks, and you're now locking it into a building material. But the way it actually continues to react, you know, with the lime over time, it will actually absorb more CO2 from the air um, in a process known as carbonification that actually helps to set the structure even more. So. Wow. It's a very breathable, you know, uh, natural wall that has good, uh, you know, pest resistance, lightweight. And again, you know, instead of having to, you know, import truck materials, you know, cutting down um, and use of excessive, you know, lumber, whether it's for paper, whether it's for building materials, I think the future of hemp composites and, you know, because you can grow, in a, it's an annual, you can grow a single crop or even a couple of crops in a single growing season, you know, versus trees that may take a couple of decades to appropriately mature. So in, you know, from an environmental perspective and its ability to really kind of, you know, break apart compacted soil, um, you know, to detoxify heavy metals, um, I think hemp is an absolute necessity from an environmental perspective uh, of sustainability and healing the planet. So basically, basically, that's the best way to go green is literally just use hemp. Absolutely. I mean, talk about, too, the soil remediation. They plant hemp at Chernobyl, and it sucks up the radiation out of the soil. Wow, really? Yeah. I when mean, did it, they start doing this? They've been doing this for years because hemp, hemp has been, uh, you know, native crop to, uh, you know, Russia for millennia. And, um, and they've been using hemp there to remediate the heavy metals. Of course, any hemp that would be used for said purposes, you probably don't want to extract the CBD from. Mm -hmm. It's important to differentiate between the different types of hemp and its different end uses and how to best kind of, you know, deal with that. 
Definitely, definitely. And when I think of Chernobyl, you ever seen that movie? Uh, what is it called? I think it's called Chernobyl, where they like go out there and they're doing like a documentary or whatever, and then they all die. Hmm. Yeah, because like the I guess like the people that like were stuck in Chernobyl, um, they turned into like some radioactive people eating things. Or Zombies, whatever. of yeah, course. Yeah, it was a crazy movie. But when I think Chernobyl, it's the first thing I think of, and it's probably not the best thing to think of. But <laughs> that's what makes me think of. That's crazy. They they use the hemp to pull out all the. The, uh, it's one of the ways that helps to kind of because there was a lot of radioactive fallout that occurred, yeah. you know, um, after Chernobyl that resulted in this, you know, huge incidence of thyroid cancers, you know, um, all across, um, you know, Central Asia. So by using hemp, that helps to kind of remediate and kind of keep it there. And then ideally, you would just basically continue to compost that hemp in place, and then you can just replant year after year again because it is an annual and by just kind of staying there it is you know fixed there instead of you know floating around you know making its way continually into the waterways and whatnot i think uh i can't remember i was in my sociology class there was a radioactive plant that like blew up i can't remember what country it was i don't want to say it was asia or china or is it japan um, but it was right on the ocean. And Fukushima we, in Japan th- after the tsunami. Um, that turned into an earthquake. Or <laughs> yep, yep, yeah, yeah. We were learning about that, and um, the, all that radioactive like floated out to the ocean. And, like fishermen, like people were so scared to eat. I think like the government basically like paid for the food or something like that because like they knew that there was radioactive in the fish, and like they knew they kind of screwed up. So they're like basically like, here, like still eat. Are they trying to say it was like a safe level or something like that? Um, it was a pretty interesting like class period because like I didn't never heard of this event before but the fact that that one plant that exploded like all that radioactive material they said within like 10 years or something like that it would make its way to uh, the US well so one of the concerns is the Fukushima Daiichi reactor is still leaking radioactive material and that radioactive material has unfortunately been showing up on the west coast of the US in some of the fisheries um, some seal populations so there, there's a lot of ongoing environmental disasters right now that I think we really need to wake up to because we don't really have much time left on that. And um, not to be doom and gloom, but I, I recommend people at least kind of develop an awareness around that. Um, and it may be necessary to to be kind of weary of some of the seafood that's going to be coming from the West Coast over time. Uh, as you mentioned about levels, unfortunately, a lot of times when you have ecological disasters, what's the solution? You raise the safe level and ta-da, no more ecological disasters. Yeah, so. they, they, they even, uh, when they're building the, the plant, they claim that they built the wall high enough that it could at last, like, the worst earthquake or the worst tsunami. And then look what happened. Like, something even worse came and then, you know, it they didn't, they didn't withstand. And I thought that was interesting. Like, they, they tried to prepare for the worst. Like, okay, we live by the water. We've had earthquakes. We've had tsunamis before. Let's prepare for this. Let's build a really, really big wall. And then it's not even big enough at the end of the day. Well, you're just thinking of the external walls. Let's talk about the internal, the firewalls, and, of course, oh, the wow. Stuxnet virus. But that's another topic for another time. <laughs> I want us to focus on hemp today. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's, that, that's always really interesting. But um, back to the uses of hemp, too. So seeds, too. Like, seeds, you can, you know, there's cooking oil, flour, milk. Uh, dietary supplements, even beer, bakeries, uh, animal, you know, feeding animals, which that's a huge thing today is like, you know, what are we feeding our animals? And we're eating them at the same time, you know, so it's like, you know, it's like that whole saying, you are what you eat. Mm-hmm. So that goes pretty deep. You got protein powder, paint, fuel, fuel, like in like beauty care products too. Like, you know, makeup's a huge thing. You see all over YouTube, you know, all these people are professional makeup, you know, whatever, like even hemp, like that's, that's insane to me. So, I mean... Fun fact, Henry Ford, his first Model T, it was made all out of hemp, and it ran on hemp fuel. Really? Right? Isn't that right? Well, it was, yeah, it was made out of hemp panels, and it was designed to run on hemp biodiesel. The, yeah. um, so, you know, hemp being a good source of hydrocarbons to be made into biodiesel. Um, but getting back to the seeds, so there's a few key notes I want the seeds I want people to know about. So first of all, um, you know, the fatty acid content. So you have a ideal blend between your omega-6, omega-3, and omega-9 fatty acids present within um, hemp seed oil. Um, One of the issues most Americans have in the standard American diet is it tends to be a lot higher in um, more of the pro-inflammatory omega-6s. So it's a good um, vegan source of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, And that, of course, will also, when animals eat that, should in turn impact their fatty acid profile versus when they're eating, you know, corn and soy uh, on a regular basis. GMO Um, corn and soy. Exactly, which 
all the accompanying. Um, actually, I actually just had I did a podcast with uh, John Maloney, and mm-hmm. he is a he's a he's a company called Critical Thinker, mm-hmm. and uh, it's like a bunch of pseudoscience stuff. And we were talking about GMOs and like, are they actually good for you? Are they actually bad for you? Whatever. There's a huge debate behind that. But mm-hmm. sorry, continue on. Sorry. Uh, no worries. And. <laughs> uh, so in addition to the oil content that we have, um, we also have a very good protein content in which um, all the essential amino acids are present. The protein is very easily digestible because of a component called globulin estidin. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of different kind of end-use products, whether you're talking about just the actual roasted seeds, the hearts, which are basically the inner kind of um, fattier part. And then those can be, you know, ground up into flowers, like we said, and, you know, used to kind of fortify the fiber content of baked goods. So if you're grounding up the whole seeds, you're getting a great amount of fiber. Um, and traditionally speaking, you know, hemp seeds were used a lot in traditional Chinese medicine um, for some other antiparasitic action as well with all the shells and uh, whatnot. So interesting. So it's, it's a really phenomenal, uh, phenomenal, you know, type of, you know, food that comes from that. And it would make sense that people would be cultivating it if you kind of have all these end uses coming from a single plant. A hundred percent. And I'm looking right at the, the roots, uh, medicine, organic compost, and then the leaves and flowers, medicine, uh, mulch, and animal bedding. Like there's so many uses for this plant, up to 50,000 uses to be exact. That's crazy. Like in a good way. Like that's and, and people wonder why it's been made illegal these last eighty years or so in the U.S. It's like because there's all these uses and it would literally threaten billions of dollars of industries. All those major corporations that yeah. don't want you to you know not spend money on them. Right. Crazy world we live in. Yeah. I just <laughs> wanted to mention about the seeds too. It's one of the few plant sources of all the essential amino acids. So that's rare in the plant world. Usually people think that you need to eat meat to get these amino acids. And quinoa and hemp are one of the few plant sources I'm aware of that have all of our essential amino acids, the perfect ratio of fatty acids. It's it's literally a perfect food. Can't ruin that. Yeah. I mean, you could, but don't do it. Right. You know? So, but let's jump into your, your guys' company. I mean, you guys join forces together to create a company to help uh, benefit people, you know, worldwide. That's the, that's the goal, you know? So let's jump into that. I mean, how did that come about when you guys first met? You're like, yo, let's start a, you know, let's start a hemp company. Well, uh, I don't think it was uh, as soon as we met, like we knew we were going to start a hemp company. We just we, we knew that there was a, a, a shared kind of camaraderie and, you know, a brotherhood that immediately kind of, you know, formed between us when we met, you know, a similar kind of like mindedness on a number of issues. And I think we all knew that, you know, cannabis was very beneficial. We developed a lot of excitement around CBD. Um, our other business partner wasn't able to be here today, uh, Noli. Dilly, um, of course, had concerns with that because of, um, you know, its potential benefits for neurodegenerative disorders, um, you know, with his father um, having dementia. So, I mean, it's kind of everyone kind of had a number of their, you know, own reasons to gravitate towards it. But I think that moment of like, we're going to do this was we, we knew we would do something together in the cannabis industry one day. But as soon as like hemp was legalized in Wisconsin, we just kind of like all like contact. There's like, we're doing this. This is now. So that's awesome. It's like when uh, Mario eats the, the mushroom and he grows and it's like, or he gets the start. It's like, dun, 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 dun. you know, that's like the moment for you right there. Like, that's funny. You say cha-ching. that. Yeah. <laughs> Mushrooms were a great benefit in this company starting as well. <laughs> I'll just put that out there. <laughs> hey, that, that's totally, dude. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. That is incredible, man. So, um, so better living botanicals. Yes. Incredible name. You guys have incredible products. I was doing research on your website. I mean, you guys have. I mean, an about an about us part, right? And I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I mean, it's. I mean, it's credible itself. I mean, five years of just hemp deprived. CBD, you know, just learning and studying all this stuff, and you know, getting the you know the the facts. And basically putting your own, you know, your own taste and touch into it. You know what I mean? It's like cooking your own, like cooking a meal. You know what I mean? You're putting your own spices and you're making it your way. Mm. And that's why it's unique and special. So (laughs) um, funny you should say that (laughs) with Kareem here, also a medical chef. (laughs) That's awesome. So it's, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, and while I was learning about it, I mean, I was definitely, you know, trying different companies' products so I can, you know, objectively evaluate and see like which company had the best product in which category. Um, but definitely, I've always been one in the kitchen, and I enjoy kind of cooking and bringing, you know, concepts of different things together, and especially with um, our additional botanical medicine training that we um, got through naturopathic school, really wanted to kind of bring that uh, to the forefront of some of the formulations that um, I was doing. So it's kind of, 
there's definitely a kitchen-esque aspect, but it's a little bit more scientific because I'm wearing a lab coat and using scales and beakers and all right, of that. Right, right. I'd still trust whatever you cook, that's for <laughs> sure. But I've been really wanting to do that was, like, cook meals with, like, you know, CBD-infused or cannabis-infused meals because I love to cook at home, man. I'm from an Italian family, so, like, mm-hmm. I learned to cook at a young age. You know, yep. single parent, I had to learn how to cook to, you know, feed feed the family, but... Dude, like, I love cooking, man, and, like, that's, like, one thing, like, I watch on, uh, I think it's on Netflix or Hulu, it's, uh, what's it called? It's, uh, it's like a cannabis show where, like, uh... Oh, Cooking on High? Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. yeah. It's super, like, it's so cool to watch that, because they're cooking all these cool dishes. I mean, they even have alcohol-infused, like, THC drinks. Like, you, not only are you going to get drunk, but you also get high from the same drink. Like, that's crazy to me, you know? Like, mm-hmm. it's just so interesting to see these, like, how the, the industry has expanded and how it's being pushed in so many different ways. I mean... I would love to go to a restaurant locally and have a, you know, cannabis infused uh, fettuccine Alfredo or like mm-hmm. spaghetti or pizza or, you know, a steak with like, we're talking about garlic mm-hmm. butter that's infused. Like, I would love to have that. Yeah. Well, our, our goal is to eventually get in a little bit more in depth into the um, medically infused edibles. But um, I, I think a different aspect of the approach we want to do is. You know, one thing you want to realize is when you're giving a medicine, you want to give it, you know, for the sake of healing. And so you don't want to throw stuff with it that's going to kind of negate the benefits of what you're doing. So Yeah, I don't agree to the whole alcohol thing. Well, that 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 one for sure. But, I mean, even just like, you know, it's, it gets a little, you know, kind of silly after a while when you start getting into like, you know, CBD donuts and ice cream and right. whatnot. And yeah. I mean, it, it, it's kind of fun. But the thing is, I think we really need to think about, you know, food as our first medicine. That's going to oh, yeah. be our first step as naturopathic doctors. So it's like, yeah, get your hemp seeds, this and that. But like, you know, hemp seeds and a few CBD lollipops and or CBD pizza or whatnot. I, I don't think that's going to be how you're going to achieve your health. Uh, oh, no, no. But, uh, but I think that there definitely is... You know, we're going to continue to see an explosion in the area of kind of CBD infused edibles. Uh, one area where I would say kind of makes, you know, logical sense is CBD chocolates. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but chocolate is another um, plant um, that contains, uh, you know, cannabinoid like molecules that interacts with your cannabinoid system. Um, the um, N-alkylamines that are in chocolate um, as well as, you know, act to help um, your body um, recirculate um, its own internal cannabinoid, anandamide, also known as the bliss molecule. And so pairing that with CBD to me, like, is something that makes sense. And I think we can all agree that chocolate in moderate doses is a health-promoting food. So, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't always get done to moderate doses, though. I love chocolate. Well, it, the jo- doctor's job is to educate. Uh, <laughs> it's up to... Up to the patient to see how well he's going to adhere to the plan yeah. he agreed to. He said, only, about, only have three pieces of chocolate. I'm the guy that goes like, eh, I need four. <laughs> it's about education and it's about access, you know? So it's like we educate you on what's healthy and then we provide you access to the healthy products, you know? Yeah. It's it's easy to go and, and slam a bunch of unhealthy brownies or, or whatever. But if you have the option to have that healthier CBD-infused product that's, you know, beneficial, like benefiting your health... It's it's a no brainer, hundred percent, and that's when you really kind of think outside the box too. Like, you think like when you hear edibles or infused, the first thing you think is brownies, cookies, right. you know, cake, whatever. But like you said, like food is like our next. It's like, it's like the next essential thing we need in life, if not the most important: water, food, housing, mm-hmm. shelter. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the food itself, I mean, dude, like that'll be huge. Like it'd be huge to see. Like you know, you see all these like smoothie shops where they're trying to promote like a healthy smoothie. Like imagine like CB, CBD infused smoothies. You probably guys had this conversation before. Oh, absolutely. So, cold, cold press hemp yeah. mixed with other vegetables and a juice that you drink salads with hemp leaves, even I mean, coffee. Like I had, oh, I yeah. had hemp infused coffee and creamer and it was incredible. Like I just felt so good after I'm like, not only do I need my coffee in the morning, like I love coffee, but now I'm getting my CBD as well too. So it's just like a win win. Cannabis and coffee go real great together, and on all levels, CBD, THC, yeah. everything. It's kind of the West Coast vibe. It's how they deal with the cloudy weather. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so with uh, Better Living Botanicals, let's talk about the products. So in front of us right here, we have uh, two different types of uh, CBD-infused waters. We have some oils. We have a topical cream. I mean, you guys also have... Um, uh, a massage oil. You have got hemp shirts, which is, I mean, I need one of those shirts. Those are incredible. Um, I mean, so these products are all awesome, man. So, I mean, what are like the best, I mean, which product is the best, which ones sell better? I mean, which ones do you recommend the most? Um, cause I, and what, honestly, what kind of separates you? That's my biggest okay. question from other companies. Cause I've tried other CBDs, you know, like I've had people that are like, Oh, you know, try hemp works, try this, try that, go to your local, this store, this store. But I feel like 
it's so hard to decipher sometimes which one is the true, like the most purest or the best mm-hmm. one to go. So like in your opinion, what makes you different than all these other companies out there? Yeah, great question. I think people ask me that all the time at school. You know, I, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned I have a year and a half left of naturopathic medical school. So I'll be uh, done with that August 2020, but doing what I can with the business while I'm in school as well. Um, so and you'll, you'll be doctor. Doc, yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's intense. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and people ask me, how do you know what's a good CBD company? And I said, well, um, you know, try ours, first of all. Second of all, um, you know, <laughs> um, look for one that has lab results, third party lab verification on their website. You know, look for a company that has some type of reputation. If you're buying your CBD oil at a gas station or at a smoke shop. You're, it's hit or miss what you're going to find. It might say 100 milligrams. Maybe you're going to get five. Yeah. You know, they've tested that and it's like, it's expensive. And that's why people are developing this kind of weariness of like, oh, is this a lot of hype and whatever? It's, it, when it's done the right way with how we're trying to do it with the education. And then, oh, by the way, we just happen to have CBD products. We're really trying to lead with the education because doctor in Latin is docere. It means teacher. So we're, we're teachers first. And then we are educating on, you know, all this stuff that we're not being taught, even in medical school, and getting people up to speed on, hey, this is your endocannabinoid system. This is, you know, how it can be beneficial to use these products. It's not a cure-all for everybody, but quite a few people can benefit. Oh, 100%. 100%. And it's like when you look at, uh, we were talking about psychedelics off uh, right. off air, but... um you see, like, uh, states and I think even countries, I think, that are, like, pursuing, like, the use of psychedelics to help treat anxiety, depression. Mm-hmm. PTSD. Stuff like PTSD. And, like, same with, you know, CBD and, you know, the medical marijuana, the marijuana industry in general. It's just, you're just seeing such a huge push with all these things that were, you know, they're so stereotyped and looked down upon. Because, yep. I mean... It's just there's so many benefits behind it, and it's it's been studied and it's been proven. You know what I mean? Like it's Absolutely. just you can't deny it. I, I think when it comes to medical claims, there there are some certain legalities. If you aren't careful, you'll get a friendly letter from the FDA reminding you not to make medical claims about any sort of supplements. Um, but just to kind of give you a, a pretty uh, brief breakdown of our um, products here. So uh, basically, we have our um, MCT oil based tinctures and an organic MCT oil. Um, because it's uh, easy for absorption in the body um, and seems to harmonize well um, with uh, cannabis extracts. Um, And then we also have our isolate base version. So the full spectrum is going to basically have, as we mentioned, that, you know, the full expression of that plant's um, cannabinoids. So the small amounts of THC and for anything to be considered a legal hemp uh, product in this country, it needs to be 0.3% THC or less by weight. So I've heard people say 3%, I've heard people say 0.003%, and it's 0.3% THC by weight. Um, That being said, for some people, since that may be a concern, potentially that there could be some accumulation and they do get drug tested, we do have an isolate-based formula that uses uh, 99.9 plus percent pure um, CBD isolate without any THC. Um, And in both of our formulations, we um, augment them with a bit of citrus and frankincense essential oils, both to kind of help with the flavor as well as to provide some of these additional um, components, these terpenes that help support the medicinal effects um, of the cannabinoids in there. So those are our two uh, main kind of uh, flagship uh, uh, products. So the tinctures we mentioned, the topical balm is definitely a favorite. So that uses a base of uh, organic coconut oil, beeswax, uh, and a mix of some um, other oils and essential oils um, and CBD to kind of help provide uh, topical relief. Um, can be applied for joint pain, muscle spasms, uh, even Skin just kind issues. of... Yeah, you know. Like, psori- like I have a slight case of psoriasis on my scalp. So like, well, would that be like a good topical cream to help with it? It's it's something I'd say try out because, again, okay. results do vary. Um, you know, we do, from our research, it does seem that, you know, again, and I think when, you know, Adrian had mentioned earlier, some people, they try a CBD product, they say, oh, this is crap. Well, you have to understand CBD is not THC. They are two mm-hmm. very closely related molecules. They are both um, expressed together in the plant in differing ratios depending on the genetics. Um, but they have two very kind of uh, methods of action, and they can both sort of complement, harmonize each other. At the same time, CBD can help prevent, you know, the over-excessive effects of THC. So I think people need to realize that far from being like a high and not necessarily calling it an anti-high either, that would be more the, um, you know, recall drugs like Ramanaban. 
Um, but it's something that really just kind of helps to kind of get you back towards your center. So, um, so we mentioned the topical balm, and there's also a massage oil um, for you know um, various healthcare professionals to use. And then, of course, one of our favorites, at least from the uh, canine feedback that we have gotten, <laughs> is our uh, CBD pet oil, which is also formulated with some cod liver oil, um, which contains vitamin A and D, and both of those help support natural endocannabinoid system functioning, and dogs love the taste. So That's awesome. Yeah, I have two dogs, man, and we had, uh, we had some... Uh oil that we gave to our dogs was bacon flavor mm. and they loved it man they loved it but one of my dogs well I have two dogs one of them he's a rescue and he's just I don't know what he went through his four, his first four months of life it must mm-hmm. have been something crazy I have no idea but he's just super emotional like, you can ask anybody in this room they're like that met my dog like he's just like he looks like like a like Drake's Marvin Room album cover like real <laughs> upset all the time like he's worried about something but he's a happy dog like he lives a happy life but that oil, I feel like, helps him with his anxiety and oh, his yeah. like skittishness and whatnot too. So I'll put it in his food. I'll put it in mm-hmm. his water. Mm-hmm. He'll just take it in his mouth. Like he loves it. Yeah, I give th- I give my little sorry. I give my little uh, Welsh good. corgi uh, twenty milligrams twice a day, and he has a little bit of separation anxiety, and it just calms him down so much. It's unbelievable. Yeah, no, I I, I can vouch believer. for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Pablo, little Pablo. Yeah, my uh, the rescue. He has separation anxiety as well too, and. Uh, it gets rough sometimes. I mean, there was the one night where we left and we came back and he broke out of his cage and he chewed up half our windowsill. Mm. I'm like, you little bastard. Mm. Like, but it's just because those, those inner issues he has, which, you know, these oils can help. You know, that's that's the goal. And um, have you guys ever thought about making like dog treats too? Because I've seen dog treats that are CBD as well. I think um, there's definitely, you know, goals to expand our product line, but we definitely want to do it a little bit at a time. Just definitely kind of, dial in mass what we're doing um we are actually in the process of reformulating our full spectrum we have a exciting new release coming soon so stay tuned for that um with some special blends of some other herbs in there that's putting in our naturopathic uh you know training to use so you know cannabis is a great botanical but it's not the only one there's many many awesome plants out there that's kind of what got me into this natural medicine world i realized in california wow, cannabis is a plant that's good for you. Are there other plants that are good for you? Absolutely. 100%. You know, and it just took me down that rabbit hole and I haven't come out yet. <laughs> that's incredible, man. Yeah. That is incredible. makes me want to do my research too because I haven't really dug too deep into all the other plants, but I've always firmly believed based on the research I've done that cannabis was beneficial. I mean, like you said, there's been zero overdoses. All there has been with cannabis is people that get the munchies, they're happy, they, they're sleepy, and they're living their life. Like, that's just what it is. No, no, people, can abuse, people can't abuse it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, people don't abuse it. Like, sure. I've seen it. You know what I mean? But Can you talk about cream? Why exactly it's, there's no overdose deaths and, like, the science behind the brainstem and all that? Sure. So I think most people at this point in time are pretty familiar with the opioid epidemic. And um, one of the concerns is with opioids is... Um, Within your central uh, nervous system, the brain stem, um, opioid receptors, when they're overly stimulated, is going to basically slow down your, um, your breathing and your heart rate to basically a complete stop. Um, whereas with cannabis, we do not have a strong concentration of those receptors in uh, that part of the brain stem. So it is definitely very, very safe. That being said, uh, people can definitely have unpleasant experiences when they are dosing, especially with high THC and high THC exclusively. Um, they've done studies in which they've given people, you know, intravenous THC versus a combination of THC with CBD intravenously. And um, it definitely does appear that, you know, high THC on its own can aggravate certain conditions. Uh, like we said, psychosis can actually aggravate anxiety. So I think it's important to remember you're dealing with not just a medicine, you're drinking, dealing with a very strong, you know, herbal medicine. And it's important to respect it as such. And with anything, just as we would, you know, think about dosing, you don't say like, I got a headache or I've got a big headache, so I'm taking the handful of Tylenol. No, that's that's a game over. That'll be your last headache. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's going to be a very extended headache as your liver goes through painful yeah. liver failure. But um, if we're talking about, um, you know, dosing, it's always important when you're dealing with THC, especially always start low dose your way up. And when it comes to edibles, because Mm. when um, you eat THC versus when you're inhaling it or you're just taking it sublingually or topically, your body will convert that into 11-hydroxy THC, which for many people is actually more um, psychoactive. Mm -hmm. So, and it does take some time for it to get converted. So you have to, you know, account for that. So 
I think, you know, that plus differences between strains too, because again, some strains, you know, people tend to think of as being very uplifting, others tend to be sedating, others are somewhere in between. And so I think, you know, if you go overboard when you're starting your dosing, you know, it can be very discouraging for patients to want to, you know, reevaluate. So if you use a sensible dosing strategy, respect the medicine for what it is, and, you know, titrate your weight up accordingly once you kind of learn your own body, I think that's probably the best way to use it. And that's where education really comes in. You know, with, with edibles, I saw it all the time in California. People would, you know, get a brownie, and then it's like, what other food do you eat a corner of it and then leave the rest? You want to eat the whole damn brownie, you know? So people eat the brownie, and then they're like, oh, shit, this is miserable. I'm freaking out. Let me go to the emergency room. Hey, man, you just had too much. It's not the edible. It's not the THC. You just, your first time drinking, you drink the whole bottle of hard liquor. You know, it's, it's all about dosing. It's all about mm. education. So you get that tiny dose, a shot glass worth, tap five, 10 milligrams of THC, you're going to do great. Well, yeah. I think, again, with, uh, with the liquor comparison, I like to definitely distinguish between the two because right. there, there is a fundamental difference. You know, you, if you start your first time with a bottle of liquor, that may be your last bottle right. of liquor, your last bottle of anything. Right. Um, definitely overdoing THC dosages can be an issue. And even for seasoned veterans, I think that there are definitely limits. And as we're dealing with more and more concentrated forms of cannabis, it can be beneficial in its own way in that we're not dealing with you know, combusting other plant material or whatnot. But at the same time, for people who aren't careful, you can very easily take in a very large dose. And again, there can be some negative effects of taking a large dose of that. The key thing is, okay, what do you do to deal with that? And typically speaking, it's going to be supportive. It's going to be rest, hydration, a little bit of food. And again, CBD can help to counteract some of those negative effects of consuming uh, too much um, you know, THC and other plant botanicals can also help too. So, I mean, you know, uh, lemons are very high in the terpene limonene, which helps to kind of raise the mood. Uh, black pepper is very high in the terpene beta caryophyllin, which works with your body's CB2 receptor and that can help kind of calm down. So, we've seen in, again, in traditional use of cannabis as medicine, this recognition that you can have too much and that there are appropriate ways to antidote it. Not that it's life threatening or dangerous in that regard per se, unless Again, you meet certain criteria, you have certain structural heart defects, then you definitely need to approach THC with a bit more caution. But in general, it's just like work your way up with the dosing. If you have a bit too much, just give it a little bit of time. You will come down, and some supporting herbs can definitely help with that. Definitely. I mean, I'm sure everybody, most people have that story where they ate too much of an edible and had a bad time. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't mess with edibles, man. I I learned the hard way because I was that guy, oh, I'm going to eat the whole thing, like mm-hmm. whatever, you know, and then you get to that point, you're like, dude, I hate my life. This is miserable. <laughs> and that's the thing I've seen with so many people. They're like, I'm never eating an edible again. It was terrible. It's like, well, I, I totally feel you. I get it. It's not a comfortable experience when you do way too much. But if you try it with the right dose, it's so different. It can be so nice. You know, it's all about the dosage. It could be, uh, Anything can be a poison or a medicine depending on the dose. 100%. 100%, man. Now... I kind of want to go back into the drug epidemic a little bit, kind of dig into that a little deeper, mm-hmm. um, because it's, it's, I mean, it's a huge issue. It, there's always an epide- epidemic of something, but this one specifically with the opioid and the drug epidemic, yeah. you know, you have a younger generation that, you know, is easily influenced by their peers, you know, and unfortunately their peers are these people that have these high, you know, they're high up in the, 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 the pyramid and they have, you know, millions of people that look up to them and listen to them, yet they're using their platform in negative ways. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we kind of spoke about this off air, but like, I feel like that's a huge issue right now for the drug epidemic because you have all these people saying, you know, you know, pop the pills, drink, drink, you know, do all these downers, do all this and that, take Xanax, you know, smoke on Xanax, drink on Xanax. Like, that's terrible. Like, I've, I've seen what that does to people. So it just sucks that like, those people that have all that, they have that much influence, instead of using it in a positive format, they use it in a really negative format. And then you have all these fatalities and people dying. And mm-hmm. when really they could just be, you know, using hemp or just, you know, smoking marijuana, which doesn't really negative affect you that bad. So, I mean, what's your opinions on that? I mean, because I feel like that we need, there definitely needs to be, um, a strive for change in that, in that arena. And I think there it's, it's slowly happening but then there's also, it's like we take a couple steps forward, but then we take 10 steps back. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So, cool. I mean, what, what do you think would be like a good steps for change to? I think there's, there's a few, um, you know, valid points you made there. Um, in regards to the opioid epidemic, one, you know, promising statistic we have seen is in states where 
you know, medical cannabis has been legalized. We've been seeing this average, you know, 20 plus percent drop in overdose fatalities. And um, one thing to consider in terms of a, a smart, you know, proper integrative approach to pain management, um, you know, and I think, you know, even with, you know, the opioid epidemic, because of, I think, the way we've been kind of cultured to respond to drugs, it becomes very easy to blame the victim. You know, um, I lost a brother-in-law a couple years ago here. Um, because of that, you know, opioid epidemic, because of an accidental drug overdose, because of, you know, um, you know, basically the, you know, fentanyl that's been used to kind of cut a lot of these drugs. So it's, uh, it's very scary. Um, and again, it's kind of, it's a potential concern of any sort of like, you know, unregulated drug market. And this is again with, you know, markets of, you know, substances that can potentially have these, you know, life-threatening uh, type of effects. Um, now, if you're giving a little bit of THC in conjunction with, you know, your opioids, again, properly managed, you know, by proper, uh, you know, healthcare professional, you can decrease the needed dose of your opioids. And by doing so, you're also decreasing the risk of the overdose death. You're also decreasing the other side effects that come along with opioid-induced constipation. Mm -hmm. um, all of these other concerns, you know, tend to get mitigated when you're integrating, you know, cannabis as part of that strategy. So I think that there are definitely certain types of pain where cannabis will definitely be mar far more appropriate, especially neuropathic pain. This has been one that has been very classically understood to be one where cannabis can really be beneficial. Um, and again, because remember, with cannabis, there's multiple ways. There's, you know, for people who are concerned about the psychoactive effects, you know, topical applications, um, especially locally over areas of pain and inflammation, can be a huge uh, benefit, not only because of just the effects on the actual um, uh, pain receptors in the nerves, but also in terms of the effects of the oftentimes accompanying muscle spasms and rigidity that come along with chronic pain. You so, were talking about um, kind of the way people deal with pain. And, um, you know, with the drug epidemic, people are digging into different types of drugs to cover up whatever they're going through. I mean, you've seen it, man. It's like the sad boy, like, oh, my life's so miserable. I'm going to cover it up with this drug. I'm going to do this, this, and that, and blah, da, 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 da. That's just the society we're in at the moment. But you're talking about the steps of change. And I definitely agree that, you know, if people slowly, inf you know, infuse the THC with whatever they're doing, that, you know, over time, it'll benefit them. So kind of finish up what you were talking about that. I mean, well, that was... That's, that's just in reference to if we're just talking about, you know, cannabis and not just THC, THC, CBD, as well as other cannabinoids that are very beneficial for pain. And that's talking about one aspect of the drug epidemic, that being the um, opioid drug epidemic. However, um, there are other concurrent drug epidemics that aren't quite getting as much concern, whether it's the benzodiazepine epidemic or just the general overprescription of psychiatric medications to children and to women in particular. You know, so oh, many yeah. gynecological issues, unfortunately, get dismissed, you know, in the conventional medical system as, oh, there's something going on in your head. And um, the beautiful thing is, again, some of the benefits, especially of CBD, um, and other cannabinoids in terms of harmonizing, you know, the hormonal systems and helping with some of these issues, you know, for example, um, endometriosis, a very painful condition in which you have, you know, this uterine tissue kind of being deposited throughout, you know, the rest of the body. And, you know, one of the effects of cannabinoids that we know is it helps kind of prevent, you know, unnecessary, um, you know, proliferation of, you know, cells and growth of those, you know, kind of controlling the growth of things from um, getting out of balance. So, Obviously, with, you know, the concern of people with, you know, depression and um, anxiety, CBD specifically especially seems to work in that regard without being, you know, too stimulating. Um, and for kids with, you know, ADHD, for example, um, a number of people are finding that instead of using, you know, Ritalin or amphetamines, that, you know, using a, you know, low-dose CBD gummy will help kind of control some of those impulsivity behavior issues and help them with focus in a far safer fashion than, you know, giving amphetamines to children. Yeah. Yep. 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 I've seen quite a few people replace their amphetamines with CBD, and it's so, so much better. Um, and I also learned recently that there's some of the highest amount of uh, concentration of receptors, CBT receptors, in the ovaries and uterus, so makes sense how beneficial CBD could be for hormonal issues for women. Um, and then also I wanted to add, 
really give Illinois credit for the medical cannabis opioid law they just passed to where if you get a prescription for an opioid, you can go into a dispensary and use that to get cannabis for your pain instead of an That's opioid so drug. That's so awesome, man. That's, I was actually just listening to another podcast. It was uh, Joe Rogan's with Dr. Phil. And Dr. Phil said mm-hmm. that um, statistically right now, there are so many uh, prescriptions for opioids right now that there's enough for every single person in the country to have one script of 30. Uh, pills or something like that. Like, that's nuts. Man, there's a ho- over 100 overdose deaths every single day from opioids. That is, it's, that it's is just, ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know, man. And, like, the, the thing that really gets me is, like, my in my life, like, way when I was younger, um, my sister's dad, I guess I'll call him stepdad or whatever, he was a drug addict. So I saw this at a young age, what opioids and drugs did to him. So, like, when I started experimenting with, like, marijuana in the back of my head, I was like, I don't want to end up like him because of how I, I physically and mentally saw exactly what happened to him. He destroyed his own life. I mean, mm-hmm. he went to rehab 12 plus times and he just is not a good person. So like, I think that, I, I think people sometimes just need that, like that insight, like, okay, I physically and mentally saw what it did to somebody. I don't want that to happen to me. That helped me personally. Absolutely. And it's also with the whole drug epidemic, you know, it's like people that are addicts, they, they need to be treated with medical care and attention and love. And like, how did they get to that point to, to begin with instead of, oh, you're a criminal, go to jail, you, you, you know, and it's like, that's not the right way. It's more about harm reduction versus prohibition. I, feel, I really feel like that's the future. It's like, you know, when kids go to prom for high school, they don't say don't drink because that's stupid. They know they're going to drink. They say don't drink and drive be smart about it. Ah. So when you do drugs, it's like, be smart about it. This is what's going to happen. This is what you might expect. This is what you should do to be safer. You know, it's, it's more about just be safe about it. And that's where I think the future is going is decriminalization of all drugs, honestly, just like Portugal did, which is working phenomenally for them. Yeah. I, I think I read some of that with, uh, what, what country was it that like, uh, legalized heroin or something like that, like medically, or something. I read something crazy like that, and my girlfriend and I were talking about it, and I, I thought it was crazy. I didn't really see, like, the benefit behind it, but I guess they did. Well, in Switzerland, in that? Switzerland, they have, like, safe injection clinics where you can that's go. What that, I'm sorry. That's what that was. Yeah. It was a safe injection yeah. clinic, so right. um, no dirty needles, and right. they knew what they were getting, essentially. Right. And if they wanted to get help for any rehab, they would help them do that, Yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, if they're ready for that, because you can't force anybody to be ready for anything they need to no. want to on their own and with those safe injection clinics too like you could still give them that like what they're looking for but also slowly yeah. infuse mm-hmm. the cbd and thc yep. in there so they can slowly get off of what you know they previously were on so that's right now, now that we're sitting here I, I, it's hitting me now i see the benefits because at first i was confused i was like what do you mean like that's so mm-hmm. like heroin is such a terrible thing well but it is true too but like we talked about harm reduction i mean as bad as you know the actual health effects are and risks that come from, you know, IV drug use, the fact of the matter is it's also a big source of the spreading of, you know, STIs, you know, bloodborne infections. And so, I mean, when you have an increase in hepatitis B and C and HIV and, you know, sequela of cancer that can come from long-term hep C, you know, you're talking about those long-term kind of, you know, public health concerns. And it's interesting also mentioning, you know, among some of the potential uses of CBD are some of its naturally occurring antiviral activity, mm. including potentially against the HIV virus, as well as some of the liver protecting effects of CBD against liver damage and against hepatitis. And, you know, again, I'm one who's not an advocate for alcohol consumption or, or drinking in general, um, but there were some studies that were looking at people who were using CBD, um, you know, as well as, you know, drinking, and they found that the CBD seemed to actually mitigate some of those harms that come about from, you know, the oxidative stress from the alcohol. So, so like maybe not as bad of a hangover? Is, is that kind of what? Well, it, like, I, like we said, there's a few things. It's kind of helping to, you know, support the liver, again, some of that free radical damage, um, as well as potentially, again, addressing some of the other concerns, the nausea, the typical inflammation and pain that comes, you know, with a hangover. And again, you know, it's worth noting you don't have that same you know, concerns, I mean, from a pharmacological, pharmacokinetic standpoint, the way that your body, you know, is able to safely and slowly clear out cannabinoids versus alcohol, you get to this point where eventually your body is kind of limited. And if you overdone it and you don't get that alcohol out quick, you know, it's game over. Yeah. Mm hmm. And I don't, I personally don't drink, but I work at a bar. It's kind of hypocritical, but I'm going to start telling people that too. Just get your CBD, dude. I know, I know where you can get it. I know two guys. <laughs> That's what I want to do. But 
Awesome, guys. You know, again, I do want to thank you guys for coming out today to do this interview. Um, before we wrap this up, though, do you have anything that you want to say to the viewers that is beneficial? Leave them with some value, anything to say, any advice, um, whether it's in the hemp world or it's just in, in, in general. Anything to suggest to someone? Well, kind of going uh, a bit of full circle, I'd say uh, learn learn your history, learn context, learn context around everything, you know, educate yourself, you know, first and foremost, and be your own advocate. Uh, you know, I may be a double doctor, but I would be foolish if I thought I knew everything there was to know on any particular subject, let alone everything that is out there. And mm -hmm. so you will meet, you know, um, other healthcare uh, professionals who may, you know, initially you know, approach things with a certain degree of skepticism and, you know, it's just okay to kind of, you know, work on, you know, slowly educating them, showing them that this is something that we really have a lot of, you know, data from. And it's just like, for me too, what kind of sort of, you know, seals the deal is not just what we're seeing, you know, recently, but seeing a confirmation of all these uses that have been, you know, used throughout history. To me, having the science confirm that is an extra bonus. And I think if you have that understanding of that context and that history, as to how we got to where we are, you can kind of appreciate the reasons why things are the way they are. That's a great way to leave it off. Yeah, well said, man. I would just say, you know, stay open-minded, be humble, like you said, Kareem, and there's a lot to learn here. Nobody does, you know, nobody knows everything, and so it's it's an exciting uh, time. I, I like something Gary Vaynerchuk says. He's like, don't think about stuff the way it was the last five years or ten years. Think about it how it's going to be in the next five or ten years. And that's what I really try to do because I see nightlife being completely transformed. I see our medical healthcare system being completely transformed. All these industries by hemp. I mean, I see a completely different future out there in the next five, 10 years with this being a huge catalyst of it. So I'm excited. I think we're all excited. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. So Adrian, Kareem, I appreciate you guys for coming out today, spending your time to sit down and talk about this. I feel like it's a very important matter, very important topic to talk about. Um, if you guys are interested in checking them out, guys, we're going to leave some links in the, uh, the bio if you to click on. It's Better Living Botanicals and their website, I believe it's blbcbd.com. You got it. Yep. blbcbd.com. Give them a check out. Check out some of their products. We're going to try it today. We're going to try out some of the waters and some of the stuff they got as well, too. Um, I just want to thank you guys for tuning in today. That was the Daily Strike uh, podcast with your host, David Shaminsky. Have a good one. Thank you.